Top Med Talk. Hi, it's Monty Mythen here, Editor-in-Chief of Top Med Talk, talking to you live from our studio in West London. As promised, I have called a special guest, Professor John Myberg, who's in Sydney in Australia. John has been a stalwart of the great world fluid debate uh, held at the annual meeting, the EBPOM meeting in London each year, and John's been coming to us for a number of years now. And as a result of that, uh, possibly, he's conducted some of the largest trials in the world trying to resolve the great world fluid debate. So, so John, how are you? Very well, Monty. And may I say that I was gutted not to be there at EPOM this year. My first miss in uh, the other 10 years. And uh, I followed the uh, conference online and it looked, as usual, as an excellent meeting. Excellent. Thank you, John. John, can you, not everyone will know you as well as I know you. Can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and your current roles? Thanks, Mike. Well, um, I'm a intensive care physician. I worked in Australia for, you know, in ICU for over 30 years, 35 years, originally trained in South Africa. But uh, working in a major adult mixed ICU for that period of time. Um, but I guess my expert clinical work has been involved in high level research, but uh, in this space, already conducting high grade clinical trials. Mainly comparative effectiveness trials, looking at standard uh, interventions and working out the efficacy and safety of what we do every day. The launch pad of these big trials we did, of course, was a safe study, yep. and uh, that was when our, our relationship really began, um, presenting the outcome of the 7,000 patient saline versus fluid evaluation, which was conducted in response to the Cochrane analysis that Ian Roberts published in BMJ in 1999. And from that safe study, we then conducted a whole series of other fluid trials, looking at various fluid types, uh, hydroxyl starch and saline. And we're currently running arm of the trilogy, which is the um, PLUS study, which is a plasmoid versus saline study. And that's been my fluid um, research activities over the last 15 years. And that puts almost everyone else's efforts in, into a, a, a dark in the shadows. That's an incredible effort there, John. So, so John, what do you think, it, just the headline summary, is the takeaway from your previous trials? We'll come back to the, the current trial in a moment, but what do you think are the big takeaways from the previous one? What do we know about albumin in the context of the critically ill now? Well, I think the important thing is when you interpret these large comparative effectiveness trials, People often misinterpret or perhaps misrepresent what these trials were about. I mean, these trials were designed to answer one question. Yes. Designed primarily to address safety and efficacy of one fluid versus the other. Because in both the Albumin trials and the STARCH trials, there were very real questions raised about the safety and efficacy of the Albumin. Yes. Posed by Cochrane. And, and quite and serious. They, they, they suggest that it was really quite dangerous. I mean, almost toxic. Yeah. Wasn't it? Well, the mass analysis that Ian Roberts published a long time ago, and that was done the last century, and perhaps not conducted the same level of rigor that we would do one nowadays. Um, but the important thing about that mass analysis was that it posed the question that albumin was associated with a 6% increase in death in patients. And that's a very big effect size, um, and we used Cochrane's study, the Cochrane study, to power our trial to do a study looking at half the effect size of 3%. And that was informed by the Cochrane analysis. And that's why we did a 7,000 patient trial. And we basically answered the question that albumin and saline did not increase mortality in a large population of ICU patients. And that was the point of safe. You know, you obviously get insights into mechanisms and into patient subgroups, which is the a good thing of these trials, but those are always, always hypothesis generating. Mm. But what we found was that there was no difference in mortality between almond and, and saline. That can be interpreted that it's safe to use or that saline, saline is equally effective. Yes. It doesn't necessarily say that one's better than the other. Yes. But it informed the, an informed the clinical question. But I think the key thing about safe was that for the first time in the context of a blinded, randomized, controlled, pragmatic study in that in real life condition, began to question a lot of the benefits that we thought were attributable to colloids. Yes. Specifically, the uh, crystalloid sparing effect of colloids. Yep. The old 3 to 1 ratio clearly is not, is not true. And this has now come out with a number of trials that are in different settings. And the equi-effective crystalloid colloid ratio for commonly used hemodynamic endpoints is 
about 1.4 to 1. Yes. So these, these solutions don't really uh, provide a lot of sparing. And in parallel, we've had tremendous insights into the block of calyx and yep. uh, the impact of, of those mechanistic issues. And these, these observations accord with understanding in, in that. And that, I think, is probably the biggest contribution of the big uh, colloid trials to our current practice. It was raised in the Great World Fluid Debate this year briefly. I know you have to be careful with subsets, but there was a signal of possible harm in the trauma subset. And, and is that enough uh, to say if there's a signal of harm, you should stay away from using such fluids? The subset was particular to traumatic brain injury. Yes. Um, that was an important subset because the, the safe study was stratified by both the trauma yep. to make sure that we equal balance. Yes. And that was an important consideration in interpreting that subgroup. So we had 3,500 patients in each group, and that was stratified for aggressive trauma because there was uncertainty. Yes. And the overall mortality from trauma was very low, as you would expect. The main driver of death in that group of patients was due to TBI, traumatic yes. brain injury. Yes. We then saw a striking difference in mortality in patients who received the albumin compared to saline. Yeah. And that effect size was quite large, and we drilled down in that in a postdoc analysis, and we acknowledge that right, this was not powerful. It. And looked at it very carefully because of the concerns we had. And in fact, we showed in some quite sophisticated modeling that this was attributable to uh, increase in ICP yes. used without them. What's become sort of not that clear is whether that was attributable to albumin per se yeah. or whether it was due to the hypotonic concentration of albumin that we used. Yes. And my view is that it's probably a mixture of both. But the effect size that we observed in a very large subset was enough to advise caution yes. in these patients. But in fact, it may well be that the extravasation of the albumin or colloids into um, you know, the brain tissue may in fact be harmful. And I guess I would love to do a trial like that yeah. <laughs> to answer the question, but there would be very serious ethical concerns about getting consent for this. Yes. And, and John, so the, the, so with that, albumin, we, of, we often don't know the electrolyte unless it's different with you, we often don't know the electrolyte composition of the, or we don't concentrate on the electrolyte composition of the of the crystalloid component of the colloid. Insofar that the solution that we used was opposite albumin and normal saline. In, in, so, they were, they were, so 154 of sodium and 154 yeah. of chloride, because that's not always what we get here when we, when we look at it more closely. Or is that what you had at your end? No, no, that's correct. Um, but the carrier field is saline. And, okay. and you're right, the concentration may be an important issue as well. I have evidence to date uh, would suggest that saline is the sort of choice for traumatic brain injury. Yep. But we talked later about the saline versus that and salt solution trial. We can perhaps address that further on uh, in terms of whether or not that is actually true. Yes. So, so then um, if we just, before we get to that one, jump very briefly to chest because we've talked about this a lot in the past. Yeah. Some very yeah. important messages from that. So your, your headline, again, of what you think chest told us in the context of the other trials that went on around the time yeah. Yeah. well the hydroxy of starch uh, story has been fascinating it's been going on for over 10 years now yep. and it's generated a lot of publicity and press and partisan views and reactions from industry and reactions from medical regulatory authorities and there's a tremendous story and there's no doubt that your meeting was a very important vehicle to express those opinions and uh, that's an important contribution bottom line is i think there's now compelling evidence that the use of synthetic colloids, particularly hydroxy ethyl starch, for the simple reason that this is the preparation that you study the most, is associated with adverse patient tended outcomes with no significant benefit of, at all. And that alone, in my view, is enough to seriously question their use in current clinical practice. They cause adverse effect or harm, particularly uh, kidney injury, which it, the debate has been long and hard about that, and how you quantify that. But, but our view is that if you're going to measure this, it has to be compassion centered. And the only one that is important, really, is the use of renal plasma therapy and not surrogate uh, scoring yes. systems. And again, the chest study in particular was an important contribution to that debate, even though the debate got, got quite heated. The use of scoring systems to quantify renal injury. Yes. And this is germane to the SMART studies as well. Yes. Is not, in my view, a patient deductive. Right. That's, that's related to how the patient feels, functions, and survives. And the requirement for dialysis, in my view, is the key metric. And I think that is the, the key outcome from chest 
and in fact with the success studies that the exposing people to starch for which there is a strong biological mechanistic uh, process uh, exposed them to increased risk of the need for dialysis and in my view that is a very serious consideration why you should not give patients these products uh, and same, I have the same view of yes. the same view of the gelatin purely on a extrapolation basis and I acknowledge that there is no equivalent trial yeah. but the biological processes by which you are infusing foreign substances produced you know, from gelatin and from potatoes and from mazes in crystalloid vectors which accumulate in the tissues cannot be physiologically dependent in my view. So John what, what did the long term follow up show because we're, we're dealing we're discussing at the moment the relief trial you know the restrictive versus liberal led yeah. by Paul yeah. Miles trial and again one of the primary outcome variables that was different in the two groups there was so called AKI but included in that was statistically significant difference in the use of renal replacement therapy in the patients in the yep. restricted which was more of a zero balance group now they they're proposing yep. to yep. do a long term a long long term follow up uh, with Ronaldo yep. Bomo who you know very well etc i think that's what yep. Paul etc are trying to see if they can get funded at the moment what what did you find in in chest and long term follow ups in critical care patients we know is extremely difficult to to separate the signals yes so the chest long-term follow-up was, was, was pre-specified. It was done not dissimilar to what Andy Shaw's group did, uh, Vanderbilt, using, uh, using uh, registered data. We had yep. uh, six months, I mean, which we had measured with direct assessments, looking at uh, tools, and then looked at mortality at 24 months. Yes. And taking those in, in sequence, we did a quality of life, just a life years using the different tools we used. Yep. Um, and we, 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 we saw no difference between the starch group and the salon group. And that was the best metric that we had to do that. Similarly, there was no difference in mortality at two years between the two groups, which isn't surprising, given yes. that there wasn't more difference in mortality at, at three months. So that didn't really surprise us. The main objective for that study was twofold. First was to test the robustness of the outcome metric yep. using qualities and life like years gained. And remember that, a bit like the real story, these metrics aren't specifically designed to quantify long-term outcomes in ICU patients. A very prominent journal uh, that we both know is very reluctant to publish these kind of analyses on the grounds that the metrics that we use to quantify this are not that robust. Yes. These studies will inform better metrics and pre-plan to how we can really adjust, we can assess long-term outcomes that are patient-centered. Right. Which go, which go beyond the EQ5 d 301s so I'm not, I'm not criticizing my own trial. We did the best, best outcome measures we had available. The results were reported as they, as they stand. The second thing which goes in with that is health economics. Because on the one hand, you have to have patient-centered outcomes. The second one is health economics. And we showed, not surprisingly, that there were, there were greater costs incurred with patients who, um, who received starch compared to saline. And these were mainly due to increased uh, costs in the ICU which again uh, concurs with the, what the trial shows. And I think those are the important contributions of this long-term outcome study that published in the Lancet, which adds to the debate. And certainly the trials that we do now, look at long-term follow-ups, will focus on probably more robust outcome metrics that we can measure at different intervals and looking at better, better costings uh, for patients, uh, looking at micro costings and, and basically um, healthcare costings. So whilst there's a big push to do these long-term outcome studies, and they're very, very, very important, the key focus, in my view, is to remember that anything you're measuring has to be an assessment that is robust of how the patient feels, functions, and survives. Yes. And mm. the current metrics that we have at this point in time, I would submit, don't really reflect that, rather the best we've got. And I've discussed this with people, and we should take the lessons learned from these trials, like CHEST and those ones, and then perhaps make these, make these outcome measures more robust and more, and more applicable to our patients. And in parallel with that, is matching that, that to what the cost the community. And I guess one of the final comments I make about that is that looking at costing studies and outcome studies, these have to be interpreted within the context in which these trials were conducted. In Australia, where you have universal, universal healthcare, as you do in the United Kingdom, there are some comparisons there. But the comparison that's coming out of the United States, for example, or perhaps Eastern Europe, or in places which is user pays, um, those costings are quite different. And that, that generalizability needs to be considered very carefully. So one of the points raised with Paul Miles about his trial is if the 
There's a difference in short-term outcomes, like the use of uh, hemofiltration, acute kidney injury infections, but there's no difference in, and he chose disability-free one-year survival. Yep. The, the, the short-term mm-hmm. outcome is, I don't believe this, the, the short-term outcome is a bit of a ho-hum finding. It doesn't really inform us when we're trying to make big decisions. Now, I believe the short-term outcomes do relate to long-term outcomes, but it takes a long time for them to come to fruition. And as you say, we need very robust, validated measures to be able to detect that signal. So what do you say to those people who say, well, so what, that there was a transient difference in the use of haemofiltration because it didn't translate into any meaningful long-term outcome? Do you all say it's the robustness of the measure? Well, that's a very important comment, uh, Monty, yeah. and as usual, I would agree with you yeah. on that point. Um, again, it comes down to the robustness of the metrics. Yeah. I think one of the biggest contributions to the literature in that context was the long-term follow-up that we did of the renal study. Yes. Now, the renal study, as you recall, was a large trial comparing different doses of hemodiophiltration in pretty sick patients. The mortality rate in that group was over 40%. Yes. And we compared 25 mils per kilo per hour versus 40 mils per kilo per hour and the outcome measure was day 90 yes. and was no difference, which would suggest that a lower intensity dialysis mode done in Australia, which is a different practice to the US perhaps, uh, didn't, it didn't improve outcome and therefore a more cost effective way to do that. The important thing about that study was we did a long term follow up four years yep. in the survivor. And I think that the real study told us two things. The first thing is that the mortality rate in patients who require dialysis is higher than patients who don't. Yes. It's a really major insult to patients. And secondly, patients who survive that incur long-term renal damage, Yes, which, which persists for a long time. There is objective measurements of, of renal injury, albuminuria. There is an increased incidence of use of chronic dialysis mm-hmm. and a much higher mortality rate, which, which, which presents later in life. Now, this is specific to a patient population of critically ill. Yes. There are clearly pre-morbid factors at play here. There may be the additional burden of the insult that occurred, occurred and some of the treatments. Yes. And I think that's the kind of population where this insult would be exposed. In these surgical patients, which in Paul's excellent study, okay, these are patients undergoing major surgery. Yep. The event rate for renal failure mortality was very low, yes. which is why they chose to use their composite endpoint measure. Yep. And I think that a signal which shows a transient or short-term increase in renal patient therapy, which is potentially avoidable, is a really important signal. Yeah. But the question is this. If you're going to consent the patient to, an op- to, a, to, a, to a procedure, yes. you need to disclose them. Now, you expose them to a high risk of requiring one of the most burdensome interventions in, in practice, which is potentially avoidable. It's a bit like giving patients starch. Yes. I wouldn't expose the patient to get a bag of starch with the smallest equal risk of, of, of requiring dialysis. Yeah. And the same thing applies here. You've got to be, got to be careful. And... You know, what concerns me about the, the relief trial is how, how this trial is interpreted and, and then promoted or, 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 or discussed. It doesn't mean to say that, that you can now give lots more assured to patients. Yes. Because, you know, there's a lower rate. It's very carefully done. It, it's personalized medicine. It's done with less food. The volumes are much, much lower than beforehand. Yeah. But giving a, a super restrictive approach may in fact not be the, the way we, we thought it was. And the relief trial is a very important contribution to literature in terms of how we carefully use this. There's no doubt in my view that this trial, a bit like um, uh, the classic trial that uh, Peter Hortrup published, the pilot trial, yes. used to question how we give fluids. And fluids need to be done very carefully on a personalized basis, uh, integrating all the results, all the major comparative effectiveness trials and the process of care trials, such as, um, such as Paul's trial, in the big patient population. So, so uh, I, th- I get in, I, sorry, John. I get the impression that you, uh, as I do, think that Paul's proposal with Ronaldo, Baloma, etc., to do a long-term follow on these up on these patients would be a significant contribution to our understanding of the meaning of these shorter-term signals. Yeah, I would, but I think to increase the return on on the back would be yeah. to identify patients who are at higher risk. Okay, okay. Gotcha. Now, um, you know, the ones who have pre-existing renal dysfunction, yeah. patients who perhaps have major blood loss, I'm, I'm speaking off the cuff here, uh, yes. you know, yeah. uh, septic patients, emergency surgery, age, age patients, because there's no doubt that there are patients who are at higher risk and in whom a difference could be determined. So just a couple more questions from me, John. You've been very generous with your time. 
you mentioned oh, your e- ethical concerns of exposing patients to hydroxyethyl starch during elective surgery, for example. Now, uh, in in our colloid crystalloid discussion, um, where in the follow up we asked Mark Edwards, who was on the panel, um, who's one of our national clinical trialists, and and Paul Miles, who we've just been discussing. Tim Miller asked them both if they thought in the context of elective surgery, if the colloid crystalloid question was still alive, and you can listen to it online, they thought very much it is, and the trials need to be done. Now, if the trials were to be done, I, I'm guessing that you'd need to ask the question about albumin, you'd need to ask the question about starches, you'd need to ask the question about gelatins. Now, gelatins have never been approved in the USA for concerns about the safety of using them, as I understand. Starches, you've just expressed the concerns that are there about starches. And albumin might make a tight brain tighter. And if you're doing, for example, long-term, in other words, lengthy laparoscopic head-down tilt surgeries, robotic surgeries, we know the brain gets swollen. So we can all construct paradigms whereby we'd have significant concerns about each of those fluids. So A, do you think it's an important question, as they believe, in the context of elective surgery to be checked off? And B, do you think it would be ethical to do them? I mean, obviously a very important question. I mean, I'll take a reductionist view. I would have grave concerns in doing a synthetic colloid trial uh, in those patients. I think there's enough evidence now to really question the ethics of doing a starch versus phalan or plasma light solution in any patient group. I think you're exposing patients to an unnecessary risk. Okay. And uh, mm-hmm. if you did it, you, you, you need to disclose that quite clearly to patients. Yeah. And this has been the subject of deliberations with the various medical regulatory authorities. The, the drug manufacturers have been charged with producing trials. To answer this question, I've seen that through know, these trials, they are not close to getting the answer to this question in terms of the uh, design. Um, and uh, I just think that there's enough evidence, in my view, to really question the ethics of that. And I certainly would have grave concerns about putting patient of mine into that kind of trial. So I can That's my view, and I know... Yeah, I can sympathise with the regulators here, though, John, because if the trials have never been done to answer the question, and we want the evidence to know if they're safe, but you don't think it's ethical to do the trials, that does seem like catch-22 to me. It is, but the point is that the reason why we did those trials in the yeah. CIC context is because you expect the sickest patients to the, the intervention. Sure. Uh, and, and there is a dose response there. There's a dose response there. Uh, you know, and it's Perna's trial, and people always talk about the old starch trial saying it was unethical, it had, it had too much fluid, out of context. But that was standard practice at the time. Sure, sure. And we've now got quite a nice dose response, you know, relationship between giving these fluids to patients. And and um, I just can't see how, you know, a general population of ICU patients or patients with septic shock exposed to stuff can somehow be different to patients who are having okay. surgery. Okay, so we'll, Particularly we'll, given the insight. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, so we'll, we'll, loop, we'll loop back on that in a second, John, because, you know, I've, okay. I've, as I've said before that I'm not convinced that doing saline interventional trials is ethical because there's enough signals there to suggest harm. But So let's tuck yeah. the starch away for yeah. a second. What do you do about the albumin and the gelatin? Because there is, you know, well, if, yeah. there is concerns about albumin. Are there, are there are concerns. There's concerns about everything, we have to be honest. They're all drugs. And there are definite yeah, concerns about gelatins. Would you, would you, do you think we should do one of those trials or, or both those together in some sort of factorial design? They're quite different. I mean, yeah. take gelatins first. Again, I accept without any reservations that the trials have been done in gelatin. Yeah. The evidence is pretty thin. The most of it is pre and post studies and all the, all the trials that bedeviled the starch industry beforehand yeah. are taken as driven and you can get any results you want. I just find on a mechanistic basis that a synthetic foreign substance, which doesn't necessarily produce the purported colloidal beneficial effects, is a good idea. What about um, albumin? And, uh, what about albumin? So al- so albumin's al- very so expensive and still used in bucket loads. Yeah, I, I, would, I would certainly have con- the same concerns about gelatin, but I accept the evidence in there to justify that statement. Okay. And I think ethically you could get it passed. You know, with regards to the albumin the story as well, because of the logistics, the purities, the expense, the cost. But I would say that's something worth considering. I would model it on a similar sort of comparative effectiveness strategy. Uh, it needs to be pragmatic, it needs to be real life. Um, uh, and uh, I think there's a case for that. I just think that, again, I would ask people to carefully think about it in terms of what outcomes do you use to quantify the effect. As it's patient-centered, you need to have a big enough trial to look at a reasonable effect size. And I think it'll be a difficult trial to do. 
because the event rates you're talking about in these patients is very low. With regards to your extrapolation of the paradigm of patients being tilted down and, and getting you know, brain swelling from that, I think that's a very long bow. Yeah. And I don't think that there's enough evidence to, to restrict the argument in those patients. I think the you know it comes down to uh, a loss of brain barrier integrity, uh, extrapolation of albumin in high doses. I think that's a very different, a very different um, uh, context uh, in TBI is the surgery. So I think you know, if you wanted to do that in those patients, you could consider it. And the penultimate bit before we get to the saline versus balanced solutions, plasma light, Hartman's, etc. And it overlaps with that. Do you think you could answer or try and get a, a bigger clue about if there is true advantages, both efficacy, safety, etc., with albumin by doing a similar trial, in other words, a, a cluster, an in-house cluster randomized yeah. trial that they did in Vanderbilt to, to try and answer the albumin uh, crystalloid question? It, it, would that be a, yeah, I, a, I, so, I, is that be cost-effective yeah. way of doing it? I think it would. I think the Vanderbilt trial was an outstanding trial. It was very, very good, very well done. And I think that would be a very effective way of doing that in that context, in the cluster study with perhaps an adaptive design. I think that kind of thing would be feasible that, in that context. Um, I think that's, that, in that context, I think that would be a much more feasible way of doing answering the question. And perhaps even doing, you know, if you want to be even more adventurous, uh, some kind of adaptive design or some kind of factorial design incorporating restrictive and liberal. Uh, strategies. Uh, that would be a very powerful trial to answer that question. So I think the parallel group, you know, big studies, like we did in Safe, I think uh, it's useful for one context. But if I was to design an album versus saline or crystalloid study um, in, those, in surgical patients, I think a cluster study like that uh, with some kind of adaptive or factorial element would be interesting. And, and I can see the sense in going as albumin as the so-called gold standard colloid because it's, it's certainly in our country it's wildly expensive. It's 100 times more expensive than crystalloids. So, but that's, you know, but that's, but that's a key question, Monty. Yeah. It's, a key, it's a key question. And if you don't see any, any, any difference, yeah. you know, and, and to, you know, within terms of restrictive or liberal strategies which have been now validated or tested in, yeah. in, um, in the relief trial, you didn't ask the question. I mean, if you don't, aren't producing the definable patient deductions or benefits, um, then your question sort of answered. Yes. So the last thing, John, um, what, what did you, I know you wrote the editorial related to it, but for those people who ne- haven't necessarily had time to read the editorial yet, uh, shame on them, the, um, the, the, Va- the Vanderbilt trials, these you know, large uh, in-house cluster randomized trials comparing saline to balanced electrolyte <coughs> solutions, what, what did you make of them? You've referred to the, the fact that they're cool designs, which we all agree with, but what do you think they give us an answer? Yeah, I think they were they were very very important trials. I mean, I mean, I've known Andy Shaw for many years. He's a, he's a, he's a as a part from being a really nice bloke. He's, their group has done some really important work over the years, um, using their databases and observational trials, pre and post and associations, and they they've, they've taken it to the next level. And I th- I thought these smart tra- and salted trials were were very very well designed studies. What I really liked about those trials was the validity of the design, the integrity of their of their processes. The transparency of the reporting and the honesty of the interpretation. I, I, I thought it was an excellent, excellent initiative by some very, very good people, and that should be recognised. I mean, you see so much stuff is done without those parameters of integrity, honesty, transparency, yes. with optimization and changing of those things. And I think the smart will be these, these two trials were, were outstanding in that point of view. Yes. Yeah. The, the issue with them, of course, comes down to the very, very important. Uh, issues of first of all the action measures, yep. which were in a smart trial, which was basically the composite endpoint, yes. uh, which uh, the make thirty one. They quite strongly assert it's patient centred, mm. and I disagree with that somewhat because the major driver of that process, in fact, was mortality and creatinine levels, uh, and the major driver of the difference, in fact, was the creatinine level differences. I think that was a pragmatic outcome measure that they chose for their trial design, and the signal was important. Secondly, the trial was unblinded. And I think that does raise questions of ascertainment bias. And that's not a criticism of the investigators or the trial design. It's pragmatic. But there's no doubt that that does cause an issue, um, even though you've got a very powerful trial. And the third thing was done within the context of one major US centre, yes. where we basically had two big ICUs. That model is very different to the rest of the world. Now, I hate criticising trials to be negative. I think the trial is excellent. The effect size in what we saw were impressive. 
Yes. There's no doubt about that. And in fact, in fact it does now raise questions about whether or not the use of saline in these patients is safe and effective. We, you know, we're running the, uh, the PLUS study now in Australia, and uh, the Brazilians are running the basic study in, um, in Brazil, and we're going well with these trials. Yes. And we sat down with our groups, asked the question, should we continue our trials yes. in yeah. the event of the publication of these two very important trials? discussed it long and hard and we've come to the conclusion that more information is necessary to answer this, whether or not this is a true thing. I have no doubt that the PLUS study in Australia and New Zealand and the Brazil study will add to the to the power of the, the signal. In a couple of years' time we'll have a definitive answer. The SMART study, particularly in the ICU patients, the ED study was less robust for a variety of reasons, coming down to how these patients were defined. But I think uh, the, this important trial needs to heighten the acuity of, of clinicians to ask the question. And it does need to, you know, to ask the question whether or not you know, exposing patients to large volumes of saline who may be at risk of renal failure to be done. In my interview, which you can listen to online with Andy, and I was hoping to triangulate this, and we'll try and do that at, at a later stage with a, and maybe a larger group than just a triangle. Um, I, I'm provocatively, like you say, with regards to giving people hydroxythal starch, have for a number of years said, well, what, what do you do when you go to consent the patient about putting them in the saline arm? Do you, because you have to turn around and say, no one's demonstrated that this is more effective. No one's demonstrated that this is safer. There are concerns that it may hurt your kidneys and may increase your chance of dying. So why, why do you want me to be in this limb? Where's, where's the gain? Where's the, where's the, hypothesis, where's the hypothesized benefit of the saline? I know people well, say, well, right, it's the most commonly used solution. That, to me, is not an excuse. You know, that, that, that. I agree. I, I agree. And I, and, I, and I think that um, up until the publication of the SMART studies or yeah. ANU studies or Vanderbilt studies, that question was totally unknown. I thought some of the almost evangelical you know, comments about it against Salon were overstated. Yes. They were based on small studies, animal studies, pre- and post-studies, observational trials, and I thought that the, 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 the reaction people was, was overstated. I hear their concerns, and I yeah. thought, well, answer it is to do, do, is to do a trial. The interesting, interesting thing was is that if you look at our fluid trip studies, looking at patterns yes, of practice yes. over the last, which is safe and chest, there's been a huge swing uh, away from colloids and a huge swing away from saline. Yes. Based on what I would call intermediate level data and I would also say the opinions of people who make a lot of noise. Yes. And perhaps the, the influence of marketing. Yeah. So already there's been a, a clinical shift in use. I would suspect that Vanderbilt trials will add to that, that change in practice. I think the, the Vanderbilt trials now add a lot more fidelity to that opinion. Uh, I don't believe it's the final word. So I would tell people to consider that practice carefully and wait until the publication of the, uh, the PLUS and the basic studies. This is a brief comment. Um, yeah. We excluded patients with bone injury from our study, our yes. study yeah, because of our concerns of hypertonicity. Yeah, and that's a, gen- um, that's a genuine and, concern. Uh, but the basic study in Brazil is including patients with TBI. Okay, so that will be and so that, so that, informative. So that question will be answered as well. And that, that, in fact, may add some more insights into the relative impact of hypothalamicity on brain injury. Yeah. So, look, it's a, a fluid space, to use a, to use a pun. A uh, lot's happening. I mean, over the last decade, don't your meetings, we've seen the whole thing change enormously. Um, and I think we should just be happy and excited that, that very good people are doing very good research around the world on an annual basis, and it's yeah. a fascinating area. So just to uh, inform you, Jai, I showed you we did some a formal poll. In other words, we posted one, and we had about 125, 130 votes about the uh, is the saline versus balance question dead, and I'll show you the results of that in a second. But we also mm-hmm. had, during the colloid crystalloid one, at the end there was a hand vote in the room, and the room was pretty, pretty packed, a few hundred people in there, mm-hmm. and there were very few hands went up that they were still using colloids. Now, I'm suspicious there are actually a lot more people in the room who do, but it's become a bit embarrassing to yeah. admit to it in public. It was a bit like uh, around the time of the Cochrane meta-analysis, no one would admit to ever giving a patient albumin, which we know is not true. Pretty much everyone has. Yeah. Um, but that's quite an interesting change in, in culture, at least, even if, even, and your survey would suggest in practice. The result of the poll was that 59% of people thought that the saline versus balance question had been dealt with, but that's quite a Brexit vote. You know, that means overall 41% were a no or a maybe. So it seems as though the... 
the voters there believe that the trials are you know still need doing there are still unanswered questions uh, so congratulations on your endeavors keep going keep at it john and everyone who's doing it um, we hope we can get you back to the great world fluid debate next year um, and uh, we hope we get out to, uh, out to and we'll debate this further we always look forward to it. we thought we can we thought these things were going to be over a long time ago but i'm sure we'll be retiring with the debates ongoing now, John uh, Henley, the, the, tell us a little bit about Henley, just very briefly in closing. That a lot of people, we have listeners in ninety countries around the world, from Australia to Zimbabwe. So we sometimes talk about things right. that people haven't got a clue what we're talking about. What goes on at Henley? Oh, okay. Well, Henley is uh, one of the oldest uh, rowing regattas in the world. It's uh, uh, it's very prestigious. Uh, it was the first, the start of the first Oxford Cambridge boat race. Um, uh, down the Henley Reach, uh, and uh, it's become um, a mecca for, for, for rowers to go and race. Uh, I was lucky to row there in three campaigns and, and, and to actually win a race there, a win an event there many years ago. But it is an extraordinarily exciting place to go. It is, it is a Georgian regatta. The, the, the technology is still very much based around the whole Georgian culture. People dress up in their fine finery. Uh, there's big box of pims and champagne, but all that sort of fight show aside, some of the hardest racing you've done on the track. And this year was no exception. There was some absolutely brilliant racing. I'm pleased to say the Australian men's women's eighth won their elite events. And my head driver from, from, from New Zealand won the men's goals. On the positive side, uh, the St. Paul's um, school uh, won the schoolboy eighth um, and beat Eton College by a long way. But the St. Paul's crew was heralded as being the fastest schoolboy eight of all time. And wow, they were look at that. Quite, and I was... extraordinary. So... It, I you go to the uh, Henley Regatta website and you can see all the races on YouTube. Um, <laughs> have a look at the uh, St. Paul's race, the Princess Elizabeth. Have a look at the men's and women's eight and the uh, single skulls. And uh, if it doesn't make an appetite to go Henley one year on the bucket list, then nothing more. Quint- quintessentially English. And I was lucky enough to go out there a couple of years ago with you for a, a, a little bit of a sit around and watch some races. And we found a big silver cup there, as you say, with Myberg J on it. So well done, John. <laughs> well, thank you, Monty. It was one of the great days. Yeah. yeah, good man. Well, great to talk to you, John. Uh, really, really looking forward to seeing you, uh, if not before, at EBPOM 2018, uh, 2019 back in London. John Myberg, from, I will. thank you. You're welcome, Monty. I'll be there next year for sure. Top Bed Talk. Mm-hmm.